What's going on, my listeners, and welcome back to another video. And today, yes, today, we're going into theories of development. So, we're going to get into uh, Wallerstein's World Systems Theory, which kind of goes into the dependency theory. We're also going into commodity dependence, and then finally, Ross Sal's model of economic growth. All stuff you need to know for AP Human Geography, and I actually like these theories. They're probably my favorite ones and the easiest ones to know out of all the ones we've covered this year. So, let's go. So starting with the world system theory, it's an economy-based theory that can be applied at any scale, and it divides areas into three categories. Areas can go into either category and can travel into each category. Into, sorry, they can go into either category and travel into them based on their economy. Now something it doesn't really cover, and you're going to maybe see this on a personal progress check, on your test, or the AP exam, is that the world system theory doesn't necessarily explain how they travel. Uh, they can travel between any of the three categories, uh, and this can be applied to any skill. So it could be a country or be a part of a country, so a city or a United States state or an Australian, uh, Australian state or maybe just parts of a county or a parish or wherever the heck you are. So let's get started with core countries, which is the first out of three areas. Uh, as we can see on this map here, we can kind of see what is a core country. So we see uh, Western Europe, Australia, and then uh, United States and above. Those are our main core countries. Oh, and Japan. Japan's a core country as well. Now, in 1900, Argentina was a core country. But now, as you can see, it's a semi-periphery semi country. Uh, core is like the top country, the best out of the best. Uh, they have the, I'm uh, sorry, they don't have, they are the most developed country. So we see them most developed, big economies. They exploit other countries for profit, not necessarily other core countries, but your periphery uh, primarily, and then sometimes your semi-periphery uh, countries. So the core countries are the one exploiting the other ones. They're also highly urbanized. Uh, we're going to see when urbanization starts to happen, but when a country is a core country, they're already going to have high urban areas, maybe a few city-states and all of that. They're also going to have a high uh, level on the Human Development Index. So if you remember this from your uh, rankings and scales of development, uh, this is based off of you know literacy rates, uh, of course, the economy, all kinds of development stuff. So as since since they are very developed, they're going to have a high HDI score. And of course, they're going to have a strong, they have strong working classes. So they're going to be seeing more people in jobs. There's people are going to be keeping their jobs. They're going to be making not the worst pay in the world either. And then finally, they have powerful governments. I We all can agree that United States, Britain, and Japan, which are all core states, have powerful governments. Uh, and then, of course, all the other states that are core also have powerful governments. They're not that weak. They have influence around the world, not just in the areas. They may be in a ton of supranational organizations. They may be putting together organizations or different alliances and treaties and all that stuff. So these are all characteristics we see in a core country. Now let's get to semi-periphery countries. I'm going to keep that map up here for semi-periphery and periphery countries. Uh, as we go through them. So before we get into the characteristics, so let's look at some semi-periphery countries. So we see like Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, uh, South Africa, uh, Iran, India, China. Those are the big ones that I can definitely see on here. Taiwan, South Korea, Indonesia. Those are also some semi-periphery countries. The main ones that I have observed on this map. So let's get into some characteristics. So they are currently developing. They're not there at that core country level yet. They're still developing. They're still getting infrastructure and technological advancements. And they're still increasing their economy to a huge point. They're industrializing, so they're having factories. There's less people working in the primary sector. Uh, we see those technological advancements, those innovations, all of that cool stuff. There's also rural to urban migration, so people who did work in those fact, uh, not factories, farms, are going to those factories in the urban areas. And there's an increasing HGI. They were at that low HGI, and a core country's at a high HGI, so they're going from the low to high. They're not necessarily there yet. They're still getting up to the top. And then finally, they have secondary and tertiary jobs 
dominant. As we see less agriculture, we're going to be seeing more people in jobs, especially with this industrialization and those factory jobs opening up, which are secondary, if you remember this. Uh, and then tertiary jobs are also coming up, so stuff like uh, retail. We're going to see more government jobs. Uh, we're going to see their government start to have a bigger influence, hence the more tertiary jobs. Uh, and yeah, those are our semi-periphery countries. And finally, we had the periphery countries. So let's see. We can see a huge amount of uh, African countries. Actually, the only country in Africa that's not periphery is South Africa. We can see that a lot of Eastern Europe and Asia ha is uh, periphery. We see that New Zealand is periphery as well. We can see a lot of the Caribbean is periphery. Uh, and then northern uh, South America, so Venezuela, Chile, and uh, Colombia, I don't even know how to pronounce that. Those are periphery, Guatemala's periphery, and if we look here on uh, the eastern hemisphere, we can see that like Poland is periphery, uh, the Ukraine, Turkey, all that's periphery. China, uh, not China, China, China is semi-periphery. Russia is periphery. And we're going to see these characteristics that make these countries periphery. So they have a primary sector economy. So they're extracting those raw resources. Not always agriculture. We could see them getting lumber or oil. We see that a lot in the Middle East where Saudi Arabia and Yemen is. There's a large rural population. They don't have those cities in the urban areas yet. So people are living in those rural areas. So we see exports of raw goods, and not necessarily agriculture, not crops, uh, but we see those raw commodities. We could see oil, you know, from uh, the, what's it called, the Middle East. So these primary sectors are are harvesting and extracting these raw goods, and then they're exporting them. So we're going to have a high export because it's a primary sector economy. Then they also are exploited by the core for profit. We see this a ton in Africa. Uh, we watched a documentary in of uh, chocolate production in my AP human class and we learned about uh, European and United States uh, they are taking countries that make chocolate in Western Africa and they are exporting them and these people who make chocolate are making like no money it is crazy so these countries the periphery countries are the ones being exploited and then finally they have high social inequality that is not high spell and quality inequality uh, but just to let you know it is inequality so we're going to be seeing uh, inequality towards women, sometimes towards men. And this is not always the case. In Libya, I'll put on that laser pointer so you can see. Oh, uh, that's a pen. Laser pointer. So right here, this is Libya right here. There's actually not much inequality. If you look at their uh, gender inequality index score, it's actually going to be pretty good. It's going to be around the same maybe as like uh, the United States or Australia. Uh, so that's not always going to be the case, but primarily... We're going to see our periphery countries are going to favor towards men a little bit more. They're pretty traditional. They haven't developed yet. They haven't got women being educated and earning jobs and all of that stuff. Their reproductive health's not in the main focus. Now we're going to get into the dependency theory, which basically ties into Wallerstein's world system theory, but the semi periphery, periphery, and core categories. So it states that goods and resources flow between core and periphery countries. So they're not, you know, just uh, created in periphery countries and sent to the core. They're not, uh, ser the services aren't produced in the core and sent to the periphery. They're created in all three categories and they flow between them. Periphery countries are paying high prices for these core products, and this actually slows down development, and it's going to be the opposite for the core. The core is going to be spending lower prices on these semi-periphery and periphery countries' goods and resources and services and all of that stuff. And since the periphery is spending so much money on buying things from the core, it's slowing down their development they're, because they're spending all this money on there. And then periphery countries depend on core countries to buy products from them. So the money they earn from these core countries, they're basically putting back into buying core country product. And it ties in all together, and they're all dependent on each other. Hence the term dependency theory. Uh, so yeah, they all depend on each other. They're all interdependent. If periphery countries stop selling resources, core countries are going to have problems. And... That'll affect the periphery countries, and then there'll be chaos. And then the last thing we're going to go over is the periphery have resources that the core desires. So 
Uh, sometimes, you know, I mean, look at, uh, Sa not Saudi, well, I mean, Saudi Arabia is part of it, but look at the Middle East, they have a ton of oil there. Do you think countries in, like, Europe are gonna have as much oil as they do? And remember, in Western Europe, we see a ton of core countries, the primarily core countries. Uh, the periphery ones are on the eastern side of the, uh, functional region, not functional, perceptional region, 1.7. Anyways, uh, they have resources that the core desires, so that's why the core is buying for them, and all of that cool stuff. Now we're going to get into commodity dependence, so more dependency. So commodity dependence is defined as when a country exports are 60% commodities, which their economy highly depends on. Uh, if they're exporting basically just big commodities, so crops, all that kind of things, uh, their economy is definitely going to depend on it. And this makes them vulnerable to price fluctuations that could come out of nowhere, like from natural disasters or political problems, maybe your uh, national organization is not working, or a country decides to just stop trading with you altogether because they found another country they can trade with for like half the price. And these can just come out of nowhere and take little time to affect their uh, commodities. And if they're not exporting these commodities, they're not selling them to other countries. They're not making money and their economy is not going to do so well. And we're going to see commodity dependence primarily in our uh, periphery and sometimes in our semi-periphery countries. I know Brazil semi-periphery, and they have some commodity dependency. And here we go. Here is a map of commodity dependence around the world. As we can see here... Our core countries don't have much commodity dependence. I mean, you can see here that Australia, that is core, does have commodity dependence on uh, minerals, ores, and metals. Uh, I'm going with, you know, our primary. We can see here that actually ton of Europe doesn't have this commodity dependence. So that's very cool to point out. Uh, so yeah, look at this. So a lot of Africa has commodity dependence. They're really periphery. And then look at South Africa. Uh, and Egypt, they're the two pretty developed countries in Africa. Morocco and Algeria are probably coming up next. Uh, Morocco doesn't have any commodity dependence. But Egypt and South Africa have commodity dependence. Uh, they don't have commodity dependence. Uh, and they're pretty developed. And they got to that point where they don't have to depend on exported commodities anymore. We can see this with, like, you know, Mexico, the United States, India, China... Indonesia, the Philippines, both Koreas, Japan, all of that stuff. They're, they're not, they're buying the products now. They don't have to export them. They have their own uh, tertiary and other jobs that they have to make their country money. Uh, so yeah, take a good look at this map, get a good idea of what's being exported where. And let's move on to the last uh, theory of development, Rostow stages of economic growth. So this is a model that countries move forward on as they develop, and it assumes that all countries will develop. They will always move forward on this model, and it doesn't take consideration of states with unique histories. I mean, every state has a unique history. Uh, different economies, commodity dependence, and then diversity of culture and religion. And then, of course, the geographic location, uh, climates, and the geography is going to be different in different areas. So Egypt and Libya, they're going to have very different uh, geography and climate than uh, Norway and Sweden. So it's going to be moving a little bit differently. Uh, and some have interdependency countries. So sometimes three countries develop at the same time because of the interdependency and stuff. Or sometimes spe uh, there's big regions of the countries that develop at certain times. This is all things that Rostow's model doesn't take in consideration. Now they move forward across five stages. And let's get through all these five stages, go through an example of countries that are on these stages. Starting with stage one, which is to the, the traditional society. And yes, you do need to know the names of these stages. So they have a primary sector economy, and the, most of these jobs are gonna be in agriculture. They're gonna have low gross, gross domestic product growth and an absence of modern technology. And there is no modern-day country today that is part of traditional society. Every country is at stage two and above, so they have some modern technology. They have some form of GDP growth, and some countries do have primary sector jobs with agriculture, blah, 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 blah. An example of this is going to be medieval Europe. Another good one is colonial America. Now let's get into stage two, preconditions to take off. 
So we're going to see investments in trade. So they're going to be growing these pro crops and they're going to be trading with other countries. They're going to be putting investments in manufacturing infrastructure and replacement of subsistence agriculture to commercial. So families are not going to be having farms to just feed themselves. They're going to be make, uh, having farms to uh, make crops in a surplus to sell and make money or trade with other people. And with this uh, high commercial agriculture, we're going to be seeing increased agricultural yield and exports, which will allow them to make money. And then we're going to be seeing diffusion of technological advancements as well. And an example of a stage two uh, country is going to be Afghanistan. Uh, yeah, very, very cool. Now let's get to stage three, which is takeoff. So we see industrialization. So a modern day, not modern day, but uh, United States and Great Britain during that early 19th century, during the Industrial Revolution. We see world to urban migration. So people are moving from these rural areas to the urban areas to work in factories. They're no longer farmers anymore for various reasons, maybe like displacement. Uh, we see de decreased primary sector jobs. Uh, they're working in urban areas. They're working in factories. Those are uh, secondary sector jobs. They're not primary. So less people are working in these primary sector jobs. We're also going to be seeing increasing secondary uh, sector jobs, like I just said. Then we're going to see more and more technology innovations. More and more of them. Oh, yeah. Uh, we saw this, I guess, with like the spinning Jenny, the Watt steam engine, uh, when United States and Great Britain were during this stage. And an example of this is going to be Thailand. That is an example of a takeoff country. And we have stage four, drive to maturity. So increased investment on social infrastructure. So stuff like education and hospitals. Uh, they're going to be seeing investments on. They're making money to do that. Uh, rapid development of transportation infrastructure. So stuff like public service, buses, uh, subways, uh, stuff like that. An expansion and development of industries. So we're going to be seeing new industries pop up, not just factories and farms. We're going to be seeing stuff, I guess, like barbershops. That's a good example. Uh, development of certain industries. We're going to see manufacturing focused on customer durables. So stuff they don't really need. Stuff like automobiles. An example of this is going to be Brazil. They are drive to maturity. And then we have an MCQ practice. Before we get to that final stage, which of the following stages most likely fits in the drive to maturity stage of Ross Dow's model economic development. And the correct answer is South Africa. So Vietnam, I'm going to say, is a stage three country. They're not necessarily at uh, making customer durables. They're not really having uh, new... Mexico does have customer durables. However, a lot of the stuff, the technology advancements, uh, we do see urbanization. But it's not at the the economy that you would see a stage four country at. Bangladesh is definitely not there. And then New Zealand, that's up for a free country, by the way. Uh, they're definitely not ready. They're at stage three as well. I'm going to say Bangladesh is stage three. Mexico is actually stage five. Yeah, Mexico is a stage five country. So I was, yeah, I was confused when I was going through that. But Mexico is a stage five country. They've had tons of uh, agricultural exports. That green revolution really helped them. Uh, and then they have urbanization. They had technological advances. They had industrialization. So they're in stage five. They don't, they're not industrializing. They're not really developing as much anymore. Uh, they're still getting a, kind of a big of population. They're still having inequality changes, but they're still in that stage five stage, which is age of mass consumption, which we're getting into right now. Age of mass consumption, stage five of Rostow's model of economic development. So we're going to be seeing tertiary, quinary, and quaternary jobs dominate. No more primary, no more secondary jobs. We're going to be seeing deindustrialization. We're also going to be seeing highly urbanized. We're going to see a lot of cities. Uh, look at uh, Mexico and the United States. Those are stage five countries. We see a ton of cities in those states. Then we see uh, consumer durables are highly available. So stuff you don't need. Stuff like automobiles. You don't need a car. Uh, we're going to see those highly available. We're going to see a market for luxury goods, stuff they also don't need. Uh, and an example, some examples of this is America, Mexico, United Kingdom, France, and Spain. Stuff that you would think would be an age of mass consumption. Uh, and Italy, by the way, is not in stage 5. It's in stage 4. Just so you know. I don't know why I said that. I just know that. And that's the end of the video. Complete the scale check on the screen. It'll help you. Try to complete in 25 minutes or less because AP exams like 25 minutes or less for each FRQ. All right. Uh, yeah, that's the end of the video. Thanks so much for watching. Subscribe if you're new. Like the video. That really does help me out. Uh, join my Discord server. The link's in the description down below. We're a pretty big community. I mean, not big. We're a pretty good community. Hang out. You can learn things, do trivia, all that fun stuff. Game.
Yeah, I know you love gaming. Leave us a comment your criticism. I love criticism. If you guys want to watch more AP Human videos, I got some on my channel uh, related to this unit and other units. Adios, everybody.